Hi everyone and welcome to Side Dance Podcast Season 3. I'm your host Jasmine Cook. This is a dance science podcast presenting discussions with global industry leaders aiming to make research and information more accessible and enhance dancer well-being, health and training at all levels of the sector. New episodes every Monday 6am London time. Thank you so much to The Place for sponsoring today's episode. Located in the heart of London, The Place is a creative powerhouse for dance development that is leading the way in dance training, creation and performance. One of Europe's most exciting, innovative dance spaces, where artists from all over the world come to push creative boundaries, to experiment and to perform outstanding new work. The Place is home to London Contemporary Dance School, a 288-seat theatre, an extensive range of classes, courses, and participatory opportunities for adults and young people, and professional development programmes for artists. Check them out at at the Place London on Instagram, and they'll also be linked in the show notes. The University of Sydney. So Dr. Fong Yan is a senior lecturer in biomechanics and musculoskeletal rehabilitation at the University of Sydney with qualifications in exercise and sports science, dance teaching, and was also a former professional dancer. Alicia's research program encompasses the effect of footwear design on lower limb biomechanics, landing biomechanics in dancers and athletes, and dance for health. I'll let Alicia introduce herself a little bit more. Welcome, Alicia. It's so great to have you on today. Thank you so much for having me. It's um, a real pleasure to be able to um, have a chat with you today. Amazing. Sure. So if you could just tell us a little bit more about kind of what you've done, your journey to how you got to where you are now and where your interest in dance science comes from. Yeah, so I was a professional dancer and I taught dance from when I was a teenager. And I think the biggest thing for me was that from a fairly young age, I had injuries, like just on and off all different regions of the body. And It was really frustrating and seeing, particularly when I became a professional dancer, seeing a lot of my fellow dancers able to go through um, and coast through quite easily without any injuries or very minor injuries that wouldn't really affect them. And then for me, it just seemed like a never ending um, trip to the physio all the time. And so I, particularly in my last contract, I was just in so much pain and, um, constantly seeing different clinicians trying to fix myself and just so that I could get up in the morning and just function. I thought surely there's a better way. (laughs) And um, I just saw a lot of the work that had been done in sports science and I thought surely we can apply this to dance. At the time I didn't know that dance science existed. I just thought surely if we can make athletes perform better and recover from injuries better or prevent injuries from happening in the first place maybe I can do this for dancers. And so I went in and did my um, exercise and sports science degree and I went into um, honours research uh, purely by accident. Um, I didn't realise the whole world of research would um, open up to me at all. It just came out of looking for clinical hours (laughs) to tick off the boxes and realising that um, doing some work in the lab would um, count towards my hours um, because I didn't want to be a clinician. And so then, um, yeah, when I, as soon as I started seeing what could be done in uh, the biomechanics lab, I went, oh, this is pretty cool, high tech stuff. And I want to, I want to get my hands on this equipment and see what I can do and see how I can um, apply this uh, to dance. And, and that's kind of how I fell into doing research, really. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's probably not dissimilar from a lot of other dance scientists who have had the same sort of background in dance and thought there must be a better way. So when you were a professional dancer, you've kind of covered it there a little bit, but did you find that having lots of injuries was kind of expected in the norm in your in your kind of career? Or like, did people play it off as, oh, that's just being a dancer? Or did you know that it wasn't quite right? Um, to, to be honest with injuries, I think I was... I've come through a generation of dancer where it was starting to become less of the norm. It was, I I can see that there's very much still the old culture of just dance through it and every injury was like a badge of honor. Um, I know that I was, you know, myself and one other person at, um, I went to Queensland University of Technology and did the dance course there. And my friend and I, we were the highest number of injuries and highest number of visits to our massage guy and physio. It's 
it was, we laughed it off, but I think, you know, we really struggled. And I think at least at that point in time, there was a much more um, support for dancers and to help you get through injuries. But I think it's, it's certainly not normal. And, um, and of course, from then onwards, I realised, you know, especially with a lot of my colleagues, whether it's at QUT or when I was working, they didn't get injured as often as I did. And that's why I was like, surely there's a better way. <laughs> um, yeah, it's certainly, yeah, it's, it's, there's definitely something in the fact that dancers seem to get the same types of injuries. The ones that do get injured, they seem to get the same injuries. And I just want to know why and how. Yeah. So on that question, why do you think that some dancers are more susceptible and has that changed now from what you thought at the time? I don't think it's ever really changed for me. I always want, I'm, I think I've got a inherently mechanical mind. <laughs> so I, I think it's always going to come down to it's the way that our bodies work, the way that our um, individual bodies are made up, how they're built. And so that will influence the mechanics of how our bodies move. And so I think it's just something that there's going to be certain ways that we are inherently going to be predisposed to injuries, but I think there will be, there's certainly techniques that through my studies, I've realized that there are other techniques that can um, facilitate a stronger body, um, a body that is going to be uh, you know, better prepared for um, the kind of loading that we put on them. And I think it's for dancers, I think the idea that we're no longer just doing this for the aesthetics and for the, just to look pretty, that we are athletes. And so I think that shift in mindset, I think it's happened, um, you know, a little bit before I started. I mean, well, you think about when I Adams started, um, you know, it's it's grown over these um, these past years. And I think that's, um, I think that's really helped dancers in the various different um, stages of training to make sure that they are um, that they're going to be less injury prone. Yeah, definitely. So moving on from that, you mentioned being a clinician. Clinician didn't quite work out, so you thought, "Oh, I'll try research instead." Um, and you said you initially started looking at kids' shoes. So can you tell us about this and then the link to dance? So why did it interest you, and what did you find? Yeah. So the um, the visit that I had to the lab, because I was looking for hours in the lab just so that I could tick off clinic hours for my um, exercise sports science accreditation. The study that they had going on at that time was looking at children's school shoes and how really stiff shoes would change the way that their feet move. And it wasn't as it wasn't close to barefoot movement at all. So the way that the foot normally likes to move, there was just all this excessive motion happening in the rear foot, um, the, the rear portion of the foot. And as, from myself at that time, I was teaching young children and I was thinking, we put these kids in quite rigid shoes. We put them in full sole ballet shoes. We put them in at the time, dance sneakers were really the rage. So we've put them into, you know, quite young children, you know, nine, 10 years old, and we're putting them in these really clunky, heavy, really stiff shoes. And then we're asking them to point their feet as hard as they can. And these poor kids, they keep telling me, I'm pointing as hard as I can, surely, like, can't you tell? And then I'll take the shoe off and I'll go, oh, wow, you've got beautiful feet. So what's happening when I put this shoe on? And something as simple as that, when I spoke to the uh, researcher that was running the school shoe project, they had no experience at all in dance, but they just went, bring your dance shoes in, show me all the different dance shoes that you're talking about. So I brought in every single pair of shoes that I had. I had high heel chorus shoes. I had the demi point shoes, point shoes, the various dance sneaker designs, split sole and full sole shoes that I had. And talked through like all the various different um, aspects of the shoe design and how it might relate to what they're seeing in the school shoes. And I think that was the, um, that moment kind of really sparked my passion, or at least I was able to then communicate my passion for what was a burning question. I didn't realize it at the time, but I think the way that my supervisor was able to bring that out of me was 
this is something that's important to you and actually we can potentially do something about it or at least discover why it is that I'm seeing what I'm seeing as a dance teacher and why the poor student is experiencing what they're experiencing and we've got some technology that can help us do this. Yeah, for sure. So you kind of mentioned last time, I think, that there were three kind of key factors that stood out. So the first of those was foot development and then strength. And then there's also the link to injury. Could you talk us through each of these and what you found around them? Yeah, so for the um, for my honours research, uh, we were looking at the um, midfoot motion. So looking at the plantar flexion, so how much you can point your feet, but looking at that arch, the midfoot portion and so visually what the dance teacher will see is that not much is happening and that was actually in the school shoes we could see that um, that motion is actually restricted inside the shoe as well and so the idea is that if you're not able to get midfoot motion then you're going to try and get it from the ankle instead so um, joint power as well is like how much propulsion you have when you restrict the motion in the um, midfoot, you are restricting the power and that propulsion um, coming from that midfoot. And so if you're trying to push off for a run or a jump, then all of that has to come from somewhere else. And so what they saw in the school shoes was that it was shifting up towards the ankle. And the same thing is um, was then kind of a, seen as well when we moved into the dance shoes was that well if you're going to have restriction in one area it has to move somewhere else and so the idea that you're going to minimize the amount of foot motion and um and propulsion within the foot so then perhaps the foot is actually not going to be as strong and then now you're overloading the ankle and the ankle plantar flexors are then going to be overloaded the tissues are now going to be overloaded for what they're supposed to be doing and so then there is the potential that you're increasing the risk for ankle injury. Yeah that makes a lot of sense so just to clarify was that looking at that in the school shoes or in the dance shoes so you did both like test the school shoes then dance shoes or? So the school shoes were the ones that um, they've gotten a bit further than us because the school shoes they're quite rigid so we can cut holes into the school shoes and put the markers directly onto the feet and so then you can actually see what the foot is doing inside the shoe. And that's where you could actually see how much the foot swims around inside a really rigid shoe. With dance, because when we start looking at, <clears throat> at jazz shoes, when we start looking at jazz shoes, what we see is really tight fitting shoes. And so as soon as we cut a hole in it, then the whole shoe essentially falls apart and we don't have much of a shoe to have its effect anymore. Yeah, can I ask a bit more as well about like data collection? So how did you get that data sort of the, for the more scientists probably listening? Um, yeah, what was the data collection like? What were your methods like? And then also a little bit more about your results. So what kind of did you find? Yeah, so we did 3D motion capture. So we used a multi-segment foot model. So we split it into three portions. So we had the rear foot, which is the calcaneus and um, the midfoot portion, um, which is basically in line with the navicular bone. And then the forefoot that goes towards the, <clears throat> the big toe joint, the metatarsophalangeal joint. And then the last portion at the front is the big toe, which was the proxy for all toes. Um, there's certainly many more complex um, segment, uh, multi-segment foot models, but this was a um, relatively simplified three segment um, foot model that would allow us to track um, the key parts of the foot motion that we're interested in. And we also did, um, so the honours project just looked at the joint angles of the foot to see whether the plantar flexion angle changed both at the toe, the midfoot and ankle. For my PhD, we then used that same um, marker model but then we started doing um, sautés in second. And so then we wanted to see whether those observed angles would actually change the, um, the actual jump performance. So with the more stiff shoes, like your full sole jazz shoes, that, um, even though they split sole, the, jazz, the split sole dance sneakers also restricted the, um, limited the plantar flexion angle that we could see. And um, when we went to the PhD, I added in the chorus shoes 
because then I um, looked at all the dancers. So then this was another common jazz um, shoe that they would be asked to wear. All of a sudden, now we're changing the routine. We're now doing a competition and you're wearing high heels. So let's see what happens there. And so we um, had a look at, again at those split sole, full sole, the sneaker. Um, at During my PhD, we actually started, they had a new slimline sneaker as opposed to the really thick, chunky sole. They had a more slimline looking one and then the uh, high heel core shoe as well. And that one, again, that the joint angles that we could observe were certainly restricted. Um, with the PhD study, we had force plates as well. So the force plates were able to give us uh, joint kinetics. So that that's when we could look at things like the joint propulsion the and absorption, energy propulsion and absorption. So then we could actually look at um, whether that lack of propulsion was going to contribute to the overall jump performance, which is jump height. And so then we could have a look at that as well. And what was um, what was good was that, you know, we, we thought the split sole would help and it did. And um, the more flexible the shoe, the closer it was to barefoot. So we've compared everything with barefoot and um, yeah, the, the more flexible the shoe was, the better it was. And the um, and also for the dancers, they felt that they could jump better in the more flexible shoes. But the interesting one was because I was looking also at the impact attenuation in my PhD, the interesting part was about how those high heel shoes would impact the ankle and then knee. So we went from seeing, okay, definitely the midfoot is restricted, but when you put the high heel on, that also restricts the ankle motion as well. And so then it just kept shifting it further, higher up the chain. So the more rigid the shoe, the more it limits one joint, the more that the other joints higher up have to then take the brunt of the impact. And so then the knees um, then took a lot more of the, the energy absorption on the landing. And then they, the knees and hips then had to do all of the propulsion to get get you off the floor. And if you've worn high heels trying to dance, you know how much heavier you feel because you can't actually push off through your feet or your ankles you've only got your knees and hips to help you get off the floor. Yeah, for sure. That's great. That's so helpful. Thank you. I'm so, I didn't realise, kind of, I suppose the same as you when you first started, I didn't realise I was so interested in this. Like thinking about it now, I'm thinking, I think it is because it affects all the kids. So all the classes I teach, I'm thinking about it. And yeah, I didn't realise it was something I was so interested in. <laughs> um, so you mentioned last time, which really surprised me actually, comparing this sort of to the research and running, so I started to think about this and I was reflecting on it and there's like a huge volume of research into this in running. Like even if you're not a professional runner or whatever, you just go into a running shop to get shoes and they've got all this technology. Um, and it really surprised me that there's so much in running and then such a lack of this research and dance at the moment. Have you got any any comments on this? So much. <laughs> um, I think, okay, I think a big part of the lack of research in dance footwear is certainly money. Uh, when in running, it's an Olympic sport. It's a much bigger market from com the competitive sports, um, recreational. There's just so much more money in that whole field. So when it comes to their research and development, they have so much money to throw at it. There's so much more competition across the sheer number of different companies that can run the design and research and design um, as well. So I think I think from a development side of things, they definitely have you know decades and decades of research ahead of us. Um, I'm all I was very much surprised. Um, I my honours I did the literature review, systematic review of literature, looking at the effect of dance footwear. And I thought that there was going to be surely something more than what I found. Um, and I was really, I was surprised, but also a little bit upset at how little was done in dance footwear. So then when I did my PhD, that's when I had to look um, from a literature perspective for impact attenuation. I was then going, okay, I need to look at impact attenuation across all footwear, all different types of movement, not just dance, because I knew that I wouldn't find any. And I think it's, you know, 
as dancers, we have to see our feet as part of our tools, um, our footwear, it's our equipment. It's like our sporting equipment. So we should be thinking of it, not just on the aesthetics, not just on the fact that they look pretty or they match the style of our routine and the music, that it's also part of our, yeah, it's part of our toolkit. And so if we don't look after the shoes, we don't choose our shoes properly, it could have a big impact on our on our performance, but then our longevity as well as a dancer. And I think that's something that hopefully we can um, work on more in the future. And certainly I am, that's, <laughs> that's my area to try and um, bring more awareness and, and do more research in this field, because I think, yeah, it's definitely under research for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's so I'm excited. I'm excited to see what else comes from it. Um, so you mentioned you fell into your PhD because you had this list of burning questions. Um, I kind of relate to that. I keep thinking I've got so many more questions to this now that I, yeah, I want to know. Um, you, I don't know if you've covered it already because you spoke a bit about it earlier, but have you got anything to add on what you looked at in your PhD? So, I mean, with my PhD, I felt that I, I did do um, the motion capture and the, and with the force plates, we could look at the shock absorption in terms of how the body's responding. The other part that we did do was doing mechanical impact testing. So this is normally done in um, in running shoes. So what they'll do is that, uh, and what we did, we had a we made up a custom rig, and we chopped off the top part of the shoe, so where the laces and the the upper part of the shoe. And so then it's all of the materials that form the sole. So everything between the sole of your foot and the ground, we had all of that still intact. And then you drop eight and a half kilos um, of a mass directly on top of the shoe. And then there's some sensors in there that are going to be able to say how much impact force it can take, how much the mass sunk into the shoe. So when you feel like you've got really cushiony shoes where you put your foot in and your foot kind of sinks in. We want to know exactly how far that goes in and also the time it takes for it to actually absorb that impact. So one of the big key factors that came out from my literature review was loading rate. So it's not so much about the magnitude, how high the force goes when you land or when this um, mass hits the shoe. It's not necessarily the magnitude of that force, but it's how long does it take to get to that magnitude. So if it gets up to that peak really quickly, then it's a really high loading rate. And it means that there's it's happening so fast that for the body, you don't have as much time to actually respond to that. So from a loading rate that's hitting your, with your landing and hitting the ground with a high force, a high ground reaction force, if that happens really quickly, then it's going to be a high loading rate and your tissues can't handle that amount of speed. So we generally want to be able to have time to absorb and our tissues are going to work much happier if they're given time to adapt and time to um, be more elastic. The, if the force comes in really hard and fast, then the tissues are going to respond by being stiffer. And we don't still yet know what the optimum kind of level is, what level is too high or what level is too low. Um, we don't know what that cutoff is, but we do know that if it's a high loading rate, that's going to be more associated with injury risk. So your impact related injuries like your stress fractures, um, your, um, you know, your shin splints type injuries. Yeah, definitely. Um, that, yeah, it's just so interesting. I love this one. <laughs> um, so there's also the pressure, like you mentioned earlier, of the there's like the influence of the repeated corrections by the teachers. So if they're constantly saying, point your feet, point their feet. And then from their perspective, there's a lack of reflection of the students, but doing this in their shoes. And um, what are the potential impacts of this on other areas? So in aspects like jumping um, and how can this, this pressure, I guess, from the repeated correction and then the student not being able to apply it, how can this increase their risk of injury? Yeah. So if you're the, uh, the idea is that barefoot is your natural and optimal mechanics. So that's kind of the premise that we start with. And so if we're going to have a reduction in propulsion from the midfoot, say during jumps, 
it means that another joint has to increase their contribution to that power generation, to that propulsion. Um, and at the other end, when you're landing, you need to absorb more of that energy during the landing. And again, if you can't absorb the energy through your toe joints, through the midfoot, and then the ankle, you have to take it in the knee or the ankle takes it all. And we know that ankle injuries are like one of the highest of the um, highest prevalence of injury for dancers. So the some of my colleagues in the lab doing the footwear research, they found 30% less power generated for propulsion at the midfoot. And so then the ankle plant flexors had that additional 30% um, power generation that was required for them to do their running. Um, and in terms of that increased risk, it means that what we see in the kinetics is that you see a higher joint torque. So what it happens is, is that it's a greater amount of muscle torque required to overcome this external torque of the landing. So if you see a the if you're looking at the science research and it says that there's a greater torque at the ankle joint or a greater torque at the knee joint, it means that your ankle plantar flexors, your calves, the Achilles tendon is having to produce more torque to absorb that energy. Um, for the knees, you're going to be looking at that higher risk for things like patellar tendinopathy because the quadriceps are working harder. And so where the quadriceps are having to control that landing a lot more, then they're working through that patellar tendon. And so then it's under greater load. Yeah, that's so helpful. Thank you. So we touched on this sort of last time we spoke, we mentioned that running is a cyclical kind of thing, but dance isn't, but it's possibly comparative in some ways. So what's the significance of this? Yeah, so with impact um, research, like the shock absorbing um, footwear type research, what a lot of it is looking at, um, majority of the research is in running because you have not necessarily really high impacts, but they're highly repetitive. And dance is highly repetitive. We train when we learn, um, if you're young and in a recreational class, you're learning a movement and repeating it many, many times over to master it. For your elite ballet company members, they are doing multiple repetitions of plies, of jumps, and not only for class, an hour and a half class, plus the rehearsals. And then many, many hours of rehearsals, repeating those same steps over and over again. And again, that is to master and perfect and polish. And then on top of that, then they might have a performance in the afternoon, in the evening, maybe two shows that day. And so here we see highly repetitive loading where a really small difference in the mechanics if it is suboptimal mechanics that is being repeated over and over again, then you're going to get this cumulative impact that then puts you at that higher risk of injury. So rather than it being one really large impact like a rugby tackle that ends up with one broken bone because of that really high single event, high impact, high force over just one single event, an acute event, what we're looking at is this high, number of repetitions and suboptimal mechanics that are not going to be optimal for you as an individual. And so it's not so much, and this is where we're finding is that it's not about trying to find the optimal technique that everyone needs to do. It's what's optimal for you. And that's what we're trying to use this kind of technology to find out what is, what is going to be the best um, strategy for people to be able to distribute all of that load. Yeah, for sure. So looking a little bit now at the real world application and translation, which in my head seems quite straightforward for this one, but maybe isn't quite yet reflected in the dance shoe market. Um, but could you talk to us, you mentioned you had some breakthrough moments. So I think last time we spoke about when you met a physio at the iAdams conference. Um, how does this help to drive your research? Well, I think that was probably my most exciting um, part, because usually when you do research, the only people that read your research are your supervisors. I think not even my parents read my research. <laughs> so to know that, you know, going to the, the iAdams conference already, being able to present is such a, um, an exciting moment to be surrounded by people that really get where your head is at. They understand what you're thinking about. They, they have even more amazing, um, you know, ideas and thoughts and findings. And after, um, 
my one of my papers came out looking at the joint stiffness during the landings during the saute landings um, that was one of my phd papers a physio came up to me and said oh i saw that and i immediately thought about all of my patients that have knee issues they're they're young dancers and they're just having a little bit of knee issues and they really want to keep dancing and i thought oh i'll put them in the dance sneakers because they're more cushioned i know that though that particular model of dance sneaker is going to reduce the loading on the knee joint so they can continue going to dance class they can continue doing small jumps while they're rehabbing their knee injury they know that they can continue doing some dance class without having to completely stop doing jumps so they're able to continue doing low level jumps working on their technique but knowing that in those shoes they would have reduced loading and so then it's taking a bit of the load off that knee joint they can then allow it to heal and continue that late stage of rehab and get them back up on and dancing normally and i it was just um i don't know it was like this moment of oh, i can actually make a difference and i was still you know i was i think i was in the final year of my phd i'm like wow i can actually do something with this and it really did make me kind of remember why i was where that first initial question came from that that space of how can i make dancers better and it is is in terms of like how it drives my research as i constantly have a really long list of burning questions and i think uh, you know i think that's a a key to um being a good researcher is always having that inquisitive mind. But I think, you know, being connected to people that can help you translate the research, not just share the research, but actually translate it for the various different people in the dance industry, whether it's clinicians or dancers. Um, I think that's that's the real exciting part. And, I, I, and another part that um, was really exciting with the translation was the I Adams um, dancer wellness book. They um, they asked Luke Hopper and I um, to write a chapter about all of the um, some of the different injury risk factors, and so my footwear stuff ended up in there. And we looked at other other external environment factors for that could influence a dancer. And and I really think that that book was excellent because it is about that translation getting the research findings out of a lab, out of, you know, a closed conference and behind a paywall and getting it to a, a format that dancers could actually access and the dancers can understand and implement themselves, which I think is, it's super exciting. It's, it's not, it's not dry research. It's actually something that's useful. Yeah, for sure. That's something that I find so interesting. I think what you said is something I haven't really considered about it before is the connections between the different groups of people. So the connections between the dancers and then the clinicians or the dancers and the educators. And um, yeah, I just hadn't really thought about that before because I'm always, I mean, that's kind of like why I try and do this podcast. I'm always trying to get more information out, but I've never really stopped to consider about how connecting different people could be, could be a way into that. So that's really interesting. Maybe that's all for me to think about for the future um but then you mentioned you have an honest student of your own now who you're working with so how have they started to develop your work a little bit yeah so that's been a pretty exciting part of um my journey as a researcher is now becoming an academic and looking for honest students and one of the um the ways that i've furthered my footwear research is uh working with apollo um, Apollo performance where they have the dance socks that are cushioned and so they um, they were interested in in seeing how their socks would fare under that mechanical testing the same mechanical testing that I did um, for my PhD and it was some it's a simple study and particularly you know last year in 2020, when all research suddenly stopped because we couldn't do human research it was a really good study that could continue the research without the need of humans so that was extra handy as well so we this honor student she did the same mechanical test so we chopped the sock in half so we're just looking at that portion again the same as my phd shoes we just had the portion of the sock between the bottom of the foot and the floor and we tested that with the same mass coming down hitting it and so yeah what we found was 
that, um, and this was actually presented this year at the IADAMS conference. Um, so that was pretty exciting to see her present as well. Um, so yeah, what she found was that compared to, you know, if you go and get your standard Kmart sock, um, just a regular cotton sock that you would think that you would just put on to help you spin, well, the that doesn't provide as much um, cushioning, as much shock absorption as the Apollo socks did. And particularly they have, um, even within their different models, so we tested all of the different models that they have on offer. And there were models that uh, have a specific weave and also a specific uh, combination of nylon thread within the, the knit fibers that they use. And so the more nylon that they have, the more nylon that socks have and the that particular uh, shock absorbing weave that they use, that was the one that truly does match their claims that is going to be more shock absorbing. And so um, that was pretty exciting. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily just um, marketing. <laughs> so and, and the the beauty of it is is that you know the it there was only one other sock research done in the world and in athletic socks. There's only one other um, sock research for impact attenuation, and they too found that more nylon fibers means um, you get more um, of those uh, of that shock absorbing effect. Yeah, sure. And that makes me really happy to hear just like listening to you talk about it there about how they they want to do the research on that. So it's not just about their marketing. It's not just them trying to say, oh, we're like science based or whatever. I really, really, yeah, it just makes me really happy that they actually wanted to do the research and see, okay, how does this work? How can we genuinely, yeah, like a genuine care to want to better their product? I don't know. That just, yeah, that makes me happy. Um, so on a more personal note then, what have you enjoyed about your research journey and now having your own honours student? Um, definitely sharing ideas. Um, not only answering my own burning questions, um, but also being able to come up with so many more. And I think even for my students, helping them come up with their own list of burning questions and helping them find, because really that is, it's becoming, it's getting them to come around and find their passion and, um, you know, making sure that their their research is their baby. I, I, I'm i never one to say, okay, this is my research project and you do this and you do that. I, I'm always, I, I think I really appreciated that with my honours and PhD was that it was my project and my supervisors helped me to find my own answers and they just gave me the tools to do that. And so I make sure that I do that for my students as well. And I, the other part, as you said, with working with Apollo has been, and, and I've done this um, with other um, external uh, partners as well, is that we don't tell them what we want to research. We ask them what they want to research. And it's this idea of co-design, which is still relatively a new buzzword in, in research, but it makes sense. It makes so much more sense. What is it that they want to find out and how can we help them? And I think being able, and I think at the end of the day, that's what I want to do is I want to help people. And so this is just my way of being able to help people. And so if they, think that they can do better with their shoe design or they can, you know, my other area is dance for health. And, you know, if people think that dance can help them, well, how do you think dance can help? And how do you think I can help? And so then we design our research questions and our and our research protocols based on what their needs are. And, and I think that's that's been a, a an exciting part and, and something that I really enjoy because I think it's, yeah, it's certainly about helping people find um, their answers that they want and sharing ideas. Yeah, definitely. That's so genuine. I love that. Um, so just there's, I could talk to you all day about this, honestly, but there's sort of two more things I'd kind of like to look at. So the first one is something I'm sure will across people's minds so far on the podcast already, which is about demi points. Um, maybe controversial. I know that a lot of dance teachers have their own sort of opinions about this. Um, but could I ask you, there's maybe not enough research here yet to give a definite answer, but do you think that they're actually strengthening? Um, and we put I don't know, we put students in them at quite a young age, so often like nine maybe. Um, so what's still developing at this age and what are we potentially risking? Basically, what are your opinions on demi point shoes? <laughs> well, this was actually one of my very early burning questions um, before I got, before I even started my honours was this idea that we put 
these young feet into really rigid shoes, the demi points, and the idea that it's supposed to strengthen your foot and prepare you for point work. And when I saw that, you know, this idea that in running shoes and school shoes was, no, we need to get more flexible. We need to try and get as flexible as possible to allow the movement of the foot, the natural movement of the foot and to allow the, if you allow the movement, then you're going to allow the muscles to um, actually operate and work. Then it's it's certainly been something that I do want to eventually get around to testing um, in the lab and get some hard figures on this. But as I said before, with ballet shoes, they are very tight fitting. And so we just don't have a way to look inside the shoe to see the motion of the foot. Um, aside from, you know, lots of radiation, <laughs> which is probably not the um, best way to do it. Um, it has been done though. Um, but in terms of the, until that technology, until we can get really small sensors that can fit inside a shoe and tell us what's going on, um, I, I don't, I think that's going to be a burning question that will stay for a while. Um, in terms of what the potential risks are, I think we, We've seen that the foot really in terms of the arch and the development of the bones, the shape of where those bones go in the arch, in that age from nine to 12 is a really critical time for when that arch kind of stabilizes. And so there's research that looks into um, the effects of different types of training um, exercises on the development of the arch. My, I've got a PhD student who's um, uh, just about finishing um, her PhD. And so we still are looking at a few different um, aspects to try and get published. Um, but essentially we're looking at the fact that muscle cross-sectional area, um, which is one aspect of foot strength, the more flexible the shoe, the more exercise and movement that you can have of the foot, is going to increase that cross-sectional area and that's going to make your foot stronger. So if we restrict that movement, we stop it from moving at all during the activities that we want to do, then those muscles aren't going to be able to work. The activity that we want to do, like rising up onto point, we're not going to be able to use those muscles. So to me, that doesn't sound like it is logical that we're going to actually be strengthening the the muscles in the arch that are going to help support us when we're on point. And if you're not going to have a good development of the bones of your foot and the arch, that's not sounding great either. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I think if you've got, um, you know, full, full sole jazz shoes, they, they have even less rigidity than a demi point shoe. The demi point shoe has the really stiff shank. It's got the, the solid block around the toes. Um, if that already, if a full sole jazz shoe with that thin bit of um, rubber as is going to restrict toe flexion and midfoot flexion, in, it's going to change your ankle um, joint motion and the loading around the ankle joint. I, I can't imagine the implications that have been going on for all of us, um, for not only not only injury risk but even for performance as well. Um, as dancers have been getting older and from that young age and then year after year, you know, by that age as well, we're starting to, th if you're preparing for point, you're increasing the number of classes at that age as well. We're starting to go from one class a week to two, three plus competitions or group class. You know, it, it's, it, it really expands exactly like what the overall effect is going to be. And again, it's that idea, it's these small changes in loading repeated over and over again. And so, yeah, I, I think it's something that um, it does make me, you know, really wary. And, and of course, yeah, there's not, there's no research for the dancers, but I can only look at what's happening in other areas of footwear research and see, and, uh, and also intrinsic foot muscle research and see it's a lot of potential in there um, to be explored and see what's actually happening. Yeah, definitely. And I just keep thinking about what you said, I think right at the start of that. So they need flexibility on point because all dance teachers want their like, like flexible feet. That's a good thing, surely. But then we also go on and on and on about strength and give students their strengthening exercises to do like doming. I'm sure every dance teacher does the same, but 
I've never actually stopped to think about what those things do. And so they obviously need the balance, balance between strength and flexibility. Um, but I've kind of just got, yeah, this set of exercises that I give the students and that's kind of it. So I'm definitely going to yeah rethink and think about kind of that balance, what they need and how we can achieve that. And I'm excited to see where other research into this in the future might go, um, which kind of leads nicely into the complication in dance of aesthetics, which is something that kind of keeps coming up um, in so many different areas of dance science. Um, but there's often a lack of room to progress in dance because of the aesthetics of the art form. So how do you think we might be able to balance this? Um, and where do you see the future of this field for shoes? So obviously, I guess what I'm getting at is that you can't put dancers in a really chunky running shoe just because it's got lots of shock absorption because <laughs> no one really probably wants to watch that on stage. Yeah, I, I think certainly from an aesthetics point of view, there's a lot of challenges there. I, I know um, Matt Wyons uh, over at Wolverhampton, he did a, his one of his students did a great study um, looking at changing the, the point shoe so that it would already be pre-broken in. And we've seen, you know, different technology in terms of the materials going into um, these, um, some of the, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Gaynor Mindens have the different uh, materials in their point shoes to try and make it last longer. But then the aesthetics are different. They don't look like your traditional point shoe. And so the very initial launch of Gaynor Mindens and um, and this idea for from um, Matt Wyon's group of a pre-broken in point shoe, it was like, whoa, hang on a second. These are very wide. They don't look like normal point shoes. So no, I don't like it. And so there was a lot of pushback and it's like, well, Actually, when you've squashed your point shoe, when you've broken it in, that's actually what it looks like. <laughs> but it's that, and I, and that's where you know this, the culture and the and that tradition of getting your very shiny new pink point shoe and then you trash it yourself. That's okay. But if you get one and it's already like that, that's not okay. Um, so I think I think certainly those aesthetics are very challenging to push back against. I think from from a training perspective. I think there is so much more of an open mind in the dance industry of late that we are open to how can we train our dancers better? How do we train them like athletes? Because they really are performing like athletes now. And, you know, everything is, you know, the higher, faster, um, stronger, just like athletes are, but we're trying to do it all with a smile on our face and making it look super easy. And, and so this is the challenge of, our industry that we have to certainly collaborate and learn from the um, athletic populations. I think um, more innovation, more technology, technology, technology for testing, for materials, for um, using technology to be able to help facilitate a lot of the training programs that we are testing out. And um, and like I said, you know, if we can get smaller technology that we can get uh, to look inside a shoe. Um, mobile technology so that we can get that lab level of technology that you know with our 3d motion capture and our force plates if we can get that into the studio because that tech the technology is there it's developing but it's not quite at that same level of accuracy and resolution that we have in our lab our lab we've got 20 cameras the you know the the standard of the um the accuracy and resolution is like in australia i think we're you know one of the top labs that we that we've got at the moment, it's we only got it brand new at the beginning of this year. So it's, um, you know, we can improve the lab technology, but at the end of the day, dancers are not feeling like they're dancing when you bring them into a lab. It's a different environment. And so if we can get that, the mobile technology, the wireless technology, all the different sensors, if we can get that up to the kind of resolution and accuracy that we have in the lab, if we can get that in the studio, the dancers can dance like they normally would, would really have an even better understanding of exactly the hows, the whys and the whats of um, of their movement and, and what's going on. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's kind of everything on shoes for me to start. I mean, yeah, I could, like I said, I could ask you a million <laughs> questions, but I think we should probably start to wrap up. But one area I'd just love to ask you about is your involvement in Dance for Health, which you mentioned right at the start. And um, so I have touched on this with a few other researchers in the podcast, but it's something I definitely haven't spoken enough about. And I think that's because it's something that I wasn't really aware of. So it's really not the focus of this podcast, but if you could just tell us a little bit, a little bit of an overview about your work and your thoughts, just to kind of hopefully 
increase people's awareness and engagement with this a little bit before we finish? Yeah, it is for relatively new. We only just, um, at, in iAtoms, it's only just become part of the mission of iAtoms overall. So not just the health of dancers, but now there's the second half, which is looking at dance for health. So it's it's okay that you, it's um, something that is not well known um, from the dance teachers and dancer um, side of things. Um, so my, I did a really large systematic review and meta-analysis of literature looking at the effects of dance on physical health and this was across the lifespan so from children all the way through to the elderly and what we found is what a lot of dancers know inherently is that dance is amazing <laughs> so dance is equally as effective as um, structured physical exercise um, structured physical activity as, so we compared structured dance as well. So as opposed to the creative movement dance, we looked at structured dance class compared to physical activity. It's equally as effective at improving physical health outcome measures. So this is things like um, their VO2 max. So that's their aerobic fitness. We're looking at um, even some blood markers for uh, aspects of like say cholesterol, um, blood pressure as well. And of course, in things like flexibility, dance does better. <laughs> so um, it, it's dance, we can sing it from the rooftops that dance for physical health, it's equally, if not a little bit better than standard physical activity and, uh, and structured exercise um, for improving physical health. And what's really nice is that this um, review got, uh, got cited in the World Health Organization um, Arts in Health Report. Um, which again, it was looking at all variety of different arts and how it can improve um, health overall. And so the next um, part of my literature review is going to look at the psychological and um, cognitive um, benefits of dance. Again, looking at structured dance versus um, structured physical activity. And so we're in the final stages of writing. We're getting really, really close. So watch this space, um, hoping to get that um, published. Um, or at least uh, submitted for publication um, early next year. So that is coming. Um, it is just a huge um, area of um, research that is just so diverse. It, there's been lots of little pockets of research around the world that have been done, but this is about a way to round up what the, all of the current literature in the space, um, what does everyone think, what, are, what has everyone found? And so that's kind of where we're at at the moment. We, a lot of research is um, exploring dance and how it can benefit people with all variety of different conditions um, and different age groups and also different types of dance, not just the structured dance class that um, we're looking at, but also um, creative movement, um, improv and um, dance therapy. There's a variety of different um, areas there. I've got a PhD student looking at um, how dance can uh, be, um, how it's going to be experienced by people um, with chronic pain. And so uh, there's, yeah, pick pick an area, pick a population that um, might need a little bit of joy in their life and a bit of extra physical activity. And I'm fairly certain that we can do a study and um, and look at the effects of dance for them and see how we can help um, help them improve um, their quality of life um, just through dance. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I'm excited to see it. And um, that's all from me today, Alicia. Thank you so, so much for your time. It's honestly been yeah, amazing to chat with you and I'm very grateful for your time today. So thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to mention or discuss? Um, well, I think one of the the other things that we, we chatted a little bit about is this co-design thing. And so one of the um, groups that I'm part of the executive committee of is the Dance Research Collaborative. Um, and it's researchers and clinicians across Australia who are interested in dance science research. Dance science is really small in Australia when you compare it to the UK and the US. So we are, you know, we're, we're in, Australia is quite big. <laughs> so we're in these little pockets. And so rather than us being, um, you know, just a couple of researchers doing dance science, we've started this um, dance research collaborative over these last few years. Um, so that we can combine and collaborate and work um, with a variety of disciplines, um, looking at ways that we can improve health for dancers and as well the dance um, using dance for health. And so it's just a way that we can, you know, support each other. We can, um, you know, work together, foster the talent of these new dance science researchers, and um, help them, um, and also 
because we've got a group of researchers across Australia, we can also tap into the needs of dancers and the dance clinicians um, in the dance community. And I think, um, yeah, it's something that I'm excited to see where we go and how we can improve, but it's certainly, um, yeah, it's an area that is um, growing in Australia. And um, yeah, I think co-design um, in research studies is, is really powerful for whether it's, you know, working with external companies or, um, or whether it's uh, looking at developing an intervention for, um, uh, for people that might need dance as their physical activity. I think co-design is the best way to forward and um, is going to be really quite powerful. So yeah, and if, I guess if you have any questions as dancers, um, you know, seek out the research and seek out researchers come and chat to us. We want to, we want to know what you, um, what problems you have and so that we can help you. I think, I think with co-design, we, we, it's best to get in contact with the people that can help you. And um, for dancers, yeah, know that there's dance scientists around and the researchers, we want to know what um, issues you're facing so that we can help find out all of the reasons why <laughs> that is happening and make it better. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And can I link, is there something I can link for that for the Dance Research Collaborative? Is there like a website or a page or something I can link in the show notes? I will have, um, we do have a Facebook page yeah. um, that we can link to and um, yeah, and then obviously my email as well. Yeah, amazing. That's great. So they'll be in the show notes if anyone wants to reach out. Um, thank you so much, Alicia. Yeah, it's been so great to chat to you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. And I'm so glad that I could share this with you. Chat soon. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. Tune in again next Monday. And in the meantime, follow at Side Dance Podcast on Instagram. It would also be so appreciated if you have a moment, if you could please rate and review on Apple to help the podcast grow. Bye.